Welcome everyone, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Of course, our guest of honor is here on my left, Dr. Kaposi, and uh, we're really thankful uh, for your being here today and for your incredible generosity. We're excited to come together to celebrate a special milestone in New York Medical College's history, the naming of our library. Dr. Halpern, Dr. Halpern, uh, our chancellor, as well as our medical historian, will talk a little bit about the significance of the library in medical schools in just a few moments. But briefly, all great educational institutions create, preserve, and transmit knowledge to our students. And the heart of any college is the repository of that information, which is the library. And that's why this is really a special occasion and something we really appreciate. Just a few words about Dr. Kaposi. I first met him a couple of years back and he talked about a story of how New York Medical College, unlike other institutions at the time, recognized his talent and perseverance when others didn't. And this really displays a special quality of Dr. Kaposi because uh, it's been 25 plus years since he graduated from New York Medical College but he's never forgotten the fact that the college supported him and recognized in him something special. And that quality of remembering someone who's done good for you and resolving however long it takes and in whatever manner it takes, doing something in return, that's really what makes us human beings and part of society. And that's why we're so thrilled, not just for the generous donation, but for the sentiment that comes behind it, the way we can connect to each other as human beings and help bring society further together. So we honor an alum today who's lived the best of values, who's practiced as a highly successful physician, who's mentored students, and who's been generous, not just to us, but to other institutions. And so Dr. Kaposi, Thanks for being here today. Thanks for doing what you've done. And uh, this really is a, a very important moment in the history of the college. And we're grateful for your support and for your being here and for everyone else who's joined us this morning. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, our next speaker is gonna be Dr. Halpern, who's the chancellor of New York Medical College. Uh, and is not only one of the foremost experts on uh, pediatric radiation oncology, but also one of the foremost medical historians and medical ethicists around. And it's great to have Dr. Halpern here and we look forward to hearing him speak about the library. It's always an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Kadish. Morning, everyone. The college, our college is 162 years old. It was founded in 1860. In comparison, the library is a baby was founded in 1885. It's merely 137 years old. A student committee purchased the books and bookshelves originally, and therefore did not impinge upon the 19th century Adam Hammerman's budget. <laughs> we got around to giving the library a room in 1887 and a professional librarian in 1921. Through its history, our library has been called at various times the Prentice Library and the Hetrix Library. As we went from solely a medical school to a health sciences university, the name ceased to be the medical library and became the health sciences library. The professionalization of medical librarianship was marked by the founding of the Medical Library Association in the US in 1889, contemporaneous with the founding of our library. Among the first presidents were Sir William Osler, the founder of pediatrics in the United States, Abraham Jacoby, and Fielding Garrison, the great medical historian. It's interesting when you look at the history of the Medical Library Association, all of the initial presidents were men and they were all male physicians. And then with the feminization 
of the profession, the society's leadership changes to an unbroken list of women. Now, in some ways, health science education today is indistinguishable from 50 or 60 years ago. There are still lecture halls with professors professing at podiums. The slides are PowerPoint rather than lantern slides or Kodachromes and carousels, but the basic event is the same. There are still clinical students marching along on rounds, and there are still graduate students toiling in laboratories. But there is perhaps nothing in health science education in universities as astoundingly different compared to 50 or 60 years ago as the library. Let us assume that Odysseus has gone off to Troy and he's returning in 2022 after leaving home in 1962. And he's got back home and he's done slaughtering all his wife's suitors. And it's quiet after the Trojan Wars and killing all your wife's suitors. So he decides to take a stroll down the hill to see the academy and take a look at the health science library after being away from home for 50 or 60 years. What do you think Odysseus would say if he walked in there? Where'd the massive stacks of the journals bound go? Uh, basically, where's the books? He might look around and say, wait a minute, have the students lost their minds? Have the librarians lost their nerve? The students are drinking mocha latte frappuccinos in the library. And the librarians aren't chasing them out. There's food in the library. And the librarians are not going, shh, no crunching. Um, indeed, the students don't even seem to be at risk for spilling their mocha latte frappuccinos on any books, because they all seem to be working on some kind of rectangular plastic device with a screen that they're pecking at. Now Odysseus is really concerned. And he says, where are the big volumes of Index Medicus? Or for that matter, where they put Encyclopedia Britannica? Where are the wooden sticks so I can read today's issue of the New York Herald Tribune? Now, poor Odysseus would be mystified by how much has changed in a half a century in the library, assuming that he had not already fainted when he noticed that half the student chairs were occupied by women. So many things have changed, but Dr. Capozzi's gift will assure us that three things will remain the same. First, that the tripartite mission of a university is the generation, conservation, and dissemination of knowledge, and that libraries are the linchpin of the conservation of knowledge. Second, as Sir William Osler taught us, he who studies medicine without books sails an uncharted sea, but he who studies medicine without patience does not go to sea at all. And finally, as Shakespeare wrote in Much Ado About Nothing, to be a well-favored man is a gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature. Thank you, Dr. Capozzi, and also thank you to that special and blessed breed of humans, librarians, for whom I am always sure there is a special place reserved in heaven. Next speaker will be Maria Asher, who's head of our libraries, and uh, will tell us about the gift. Actually, I want to first reiterate that you're not to eat food in the library. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, we actually receive complaints quite frequently about um, someone with their crumply bag of chips. So <laughs> uh, we still do preserve a somewhat quiet space in the library. Uh, anyway, I want to thank Dr. Kadish, Dr. Halperin, and especially the man of the hour who we celebrate today as we dedicate the Philip J. Capozzi MD Library. Oh.
as Dr. Halpern alluded to, a lot has changed in, in libraries since that first New York Medical College Library organized by the class of 1885. And they have continued to change, as Dr. Capozzi can attest to, since he graduated 26 years ago as a resource, as a service, and as a place. I actually want to draw your attention, by the way, to the Chironian article to my right that was written during Dr. Capozzi's tenure as a student. So if you want to understand a little bit more about Dr. Capozzi, particularly at that time, uh, it's, a, it's an illuminating article. Uh, we also will bring up the library's history to date and culminate with, uh, with, with this gift and the renaming of the library uh, with a poster that Nick Webb will help me to design and, and create. So most visibly in, the, in these last years, as again, as Dr. Alpern said, all scholarly journals, and many or most books and study materials have shifted to an online format. And back in 1996, there was, get this, no up to date. There was, there was no Dynamed, and believe it or not, there was no PubMed, there was Medline. And some may remember using something called Grateful Med, but it wasn't nearly as accessible or easy as it is to use as it is today and still required going to the stacks and photocopying articles that you needed. There was no instant access to full text curated and made accessible by the library from your home and office as there is today. But what has not changed, but which has been amplified is the ethos of the library. The library is dedicated to providing the information needed by its learners, its educators, its researchers, and practitioners. And the library also continues as a dedicated communal learning space, a place where students can assume that they will find a suitable place for quiet study. But more than ever, the library is also a place where shared tools, technology, and resources can be explored and used. For instance, you may not know this because some of us have been away. Uh, we recently installed GraphPad Prism on the computers in the Novich PC lab in the rear of the library to help researchers create publication ready data visualizations for their manuscripts and presentations. And we're working with the Office of Student Research on further initiatives to assist with the precipitous increase in student research in recent years. Our recently re renovated, dedicated in January 2020, as it happens, beautiful large reading room was immediately appreciated as students needed to spread out to study during the pandemic. Students never stopped using the library once, reopened, once we reopened the space in July 2020. Interlibrary loan and document delivery service have been optimized and the librarians on staff have never been more well-trained and ready to assist with requests for research or reference assistance or to instruct in the area of, of evidence-based practice and research. We are very proud of what we do as a library here, but everything we do as good stewards, as good as stewards as we are of the university's money comes with a cost. What we are offered today is an opportunity to both continue and to continue to enhance the services, the resources, the space, and the staff of the library to be better than before. We are now the Philip J. Capozzi MD Library, the Capozzi Library. My promise to you is we will make you and your name proud. And on behalf, <laughs> Do you love that? On behalf of the library, the staff, the users, and the NYMC community, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for honoring the library with your generous donation. So thank you so much. Um, I think uh, Marie Asher actually underemphasized what the library means to New York Medical College in some ways, because she talked about sort of the basics, but what the library does for us here, it actually really helps us advance knowledge by planning educational programs, by supporting the students in ways that most libraries don't. 
And that's something that your gift will really enhance. So Marie, thanks for the job that you do. And thanks for your comments. So now, um, sort of 26 years later, um, and if you take a look at the picture there, you can see that except for a bit of the hair color, he looks exactly the same. <laughs> I wanna welcome Dr. Philip Capozzi back to New York Medical College to say a few words. Thank you and welcome, welcome, good morning to everyone. I feel like Joe Biden up here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kadish, Dr. Halper, Dr. Nadler, administrators, employees, and friends, many of whom have traveled long distances to be here on this very special day of my life. Good morning. I am indeed delighted and thankful to have you all here today. My parents were descendants of immigrants from Italy who came to this country to pursue the American dream. They would be overwhelmed with pride and joy at today's dedication. So 50 ish years ago, I graduated from Syracuse University, a pre med honor student. I applied to 21 medical schools and got no interviews, not even in my hometown. Fast forward almost 20 years later, I had the good fortune of meeting Dr. McCooley and his wife, Marion, who I believe are zooming in. <laughs> good morning. They were members of my gym. We bonded immediately and have maintained a great friendship to this day. I did not know McCooley was a physician. I mentioned to him that I always wanted to study medicine, but I did not have the opportunity. They told me I could still go to medical school and encouraged me to reapply. I was 37 at the time and had been in the real estate business for many years. I was very entertained by the thought of returning to school. No, really, the McCooley said, if you really want to do it, it is realistic, and I will set you up with a dean of admissions at Upstate uh, University, and you can discuss it with him. He also encouraged me to reapply. He said that atypical students uh, you know, uh, brought something to the table that uh, experience of life that the younger students did not have. So I immediately <clears throat> signed up for a Stanley Kaplan course, okay? My grades were acceptable, but I needed to repeat the MCATs. Oy. <laughs> <laughs> I signed up for the Kaplan course. The first day at the education center, they were talking about someone throwing a rock off the top of a mountain and wanted to know what the velocity of it was when it hit the ground. I said, this is not happening. And I, and I walked out. The next day I returned to the test center and I went every day, every day, six hours a day for four months. In September of 1990, I took the, I took the MCATs. Results were respect, respectable. And I applied to several medical schools. So I really didn't think I would get in. I was subsequently invited for an October interview here at New York Medical College. I remember being interviewed by a radiologist who asked who my idol was. Tough question. I responded, my father. And apparently that was the right answer because he lit up. And I found out afterwards that he had five kids of his own. <laughs> Incidentally, this suit that I'm wearing today I wore it during my interview here at New York Medical College. <laughs> 32 years ago, and it still fits. It still fits and it doesn't have any mop holes in it. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, after my interview on December 21st of 1990, I received an acceptance letter here to New York Medical College. I immediately sent back a deposit and withdrew all other applications. I was given a second chance in life. And so in August, 1990, I packed my bags, walked away from a career and moved to White Plains. 
to start a new life as a medical student in this very same facility. The bookies in Syracuse were betting that I wouldn't last one semester. <laughs> Med school is tough at, at any age and requires a major commitment. I was on a mission though, and I was determined to get through this program. The administration here and the professors uh, were wonderful and worked with me in every step of, <clears throat> of my education. They wanted me to succeed. I made a commitment 30 years ago that if I did succeed, I would make provisions to benefit this medical school. I am here today to fulfill that commitment. Several years ago, I visited Dr. McCooley for my annual prostate exam. My PSA was within normal limits and I was asymptomatic. A digital exam, Dr. McCooley noted that something was not quite right in order to biopsy. Bad news, I had a very high Gleason score that required immediate attention. <laughs> Another second chance in life because he discovered a cancer that, uh, like I said, I had no symptoms and my PSA was just fine. Dr. McCooley ordered a full workup uh, for treatment options. And several days later, he asked me how I wanted to proceed. I asked him, what, what do you suggest, Dr. McCooley? And he said, I think you should have a radical prostatectomy. Last person I would argue with, he'd been in practice for 50 years. I said, fine. I said, fine. I said, I can go anywhere in the country for the surgery. Dr. McCooley had given up his, uh, was no longer doing surgery. He told me there was no need for me to go anywhere uh, for the surgery. Enter Dr. Bratislavsky, an oncolog oncological urologist who Dr. McCooley had hired from the NIH and was currently chairman of the Department of Urology at Upstate University and tops in his field. I underwent a robotic prostatectomy. Uh, Dr. Bratislavsky resected 43 lymph nodes, six of which were positive. I went home the next day after the surgery, and a day later, my doorbell rang. It was Dr. Bratislavsky. Oh, my God, I said, he left an instrument inside of me. <laughs> <laughs> was not the case. He just stopped by to see how I was doing. I don't know of any physicians that make house calls. <laughs> we bonded immediately. We bonded immediately. Uh, and we have since become family members with his wife, Katja, who's also here today. Michael, Mark, Dean, everybody's here except for Mark. And of course, I have to mention their little uh, five pound Yorkie poo uh, named, oh. named Moose. <laughs> who I've become very attached to. I lost the prostate, but I gained a beautiful family. My, my, my PSA dropped precipitously after the surgery, but began to rise several months later. An MRI, CAT scan, and bone scan were all negative for metastatic disease. Dr. Boslowski su suggested I travel to the NIH for a PET scan that they were developing for the diagnosis of metastatic prostate cancer. They found tiny pelvic lymph nodes <clears throat> uh, that were not found on any of the other exams. Dr. Braslavsky then sent out genetic testing for my prostate, and I was found to have a BRCA gene mutation. This puts patients at risk for breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, as well as pancreatic cancer. Everyone was suggesting radiation at that point and chemotherapy. Not so fast, Dr. Rutzlovsky said. He spoke to AstraZeneca, who was in the process of getting FDA approval for a drug to treat this mutation. I was responding to hormone therapy at the time, and this drug was specific for castrate, castration-resistant patients. But Dr. Bratislavsky convinced AstraZeneca to allow me to be treated with this drug. They agreed, and I am perhaps the only patient at the in the country 
at that time with this dual treatment. My PSA has been undetectable since I started treatment. I am three years post-op. Few people get a second chance in life. I've had three and I'm very grateful. It's funny how your values change as life's journey advances and you realize that it's time to give back for the good life you've had. I would like to thank Jerry Volk, Paul Gaffer, Jonathan Godima, and Bess Chazer for putting uh, this whole package together. You want to stand for another applause? Also, a special thanks to Alex, Alex Galapanko. Is that you back there? He's back there. Traveled all the way from Manhasset with his wife, Ala, to be here. My neighbors, Jerry and Dina Guger, who are also here today, Stan. And my very best friend from medical school, Dr. Jacqueline Pevney. He's the best psychiatrist in the world. He's great. And last but not least, uh, <clears throat> I need to uh, thank the Bratislavskis for every... <clears throat> I would not be here today if it wasn't for the great treatment that I got for them. They came to me at a tough time in my life and I will take the fondest memories of our relationship to my grave. I, I love you all. Not only is Dr. Brodslavsky a brilliant clinician, but he's a philanthropist. He, his wife, Katya, and Alex Galabenko raised hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to, benefit through the, uh, to benefit the Ukraine through donations and the sale of Katya's amazing artwork. Her artwork is just incredible. Recently, Dr. Brodslavsky purchased two ambulances and 70 tons of medical supplies that he personally delivered to the Ukraine, driving 20 hours to the countryside of the Ukraine. Unbelievable. Stand for the applause. Just an amazing guy. As part of my giving plan, I have also created an endowment professorship at the Department of Urology. Uh, this, uh, for the outstanding treatment I got at University Hospital. This is perhaps the highest academic honor a university can bestow upon a faculty member. It will be held by Dr. Vratislavsky, who is currently chair of the Department of Urology. It is my intention that the funds that I have appropriated be invested in returns uh, used for the edification and enrichment of medical education for years to come. Thank you all, and may God bless us all. What an incredible story of, of success and giving back. Now nah, it was too good to make up. So, um, only one, two last pieces to our program today. Um, one is the uh, ribbon cutting and the other is snacks. So Dr. Capozzi, if you can join me up here for the ribbon cutting, along with Marie and Dr. Halpern. You get, you get what you need.